people should take more risk. That is the goal, especially immigrants, especially Latinos. Like if we don't take risks, we're never going to make progress as, as, a, as a community, as a, as a group of people that are being exploited by not giving access to the opportunities. We have to break through our system, the system ourselves. So I think that to do that... My guest today is Elias Torres. Elias is a co-founder of Drift, a software platform that's reimagining the B2B buying experience by helping businesses deliver personalized conversations with their customers thereby building trust and accelerating revenue. Drift serves over 50,000 customers, including notable companies like ServiceNow, Okta, MindBody, Adobe, and Snowflake, and reached unicorn status in 2021 when private equity firm Vista Equity Partners acquired a majority stake. Prior to this, Drift had raised more than 100 million in funding from the likes of Sequoia Capital, CRB, and General Catalyst. Before founding Drift, Elias spent a decade at IBM and went on to found Performable, which was later acquired by HubSpot. Following the acquisition, he became a VP of Engineering at HubSpot. Currently, he is building Novi, a team of experts specializing in the development and deployment of cutting-edge AI technologies. Today, we talked about the importance of embracing conflicting ideas to achieve success. People struggle to make opinions, and, and I'm pretty good at discussing the other side of everything, right? How to become comfortable with taking risks. So it's important that we learn to ask people, like, what is their notion of risk? We make up a monster in our head. We also discuss the future of the SaaS industry and how to think about building a SaaS business in this context, including the implications of AI. Gen AI for sake of Gen AI, maybe if you're good at marketing or good at networking, you might get the money, but doesn't mean you're going to get the success. So it still always goes back to like, you got to solve a real problem in an underserved industry, underserved community. Elias' journey from Nicaragua to the U.S. to becoming a unicorn founder is an inspiring one. Please enjoy my conversation with Elias Torres. Hi, Elias. Welcome to the show. Yeah, bien. Mucho gusto. Gracias. Vamos a ser bienvenido. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to bienvenido. <laughs> Awesome to have you. You've been on many podcasts, so it was uh, a challenge researching you and finding interesting, unique topics to talk about. And something that I found stalking for your Twitter feed was that you, you like talking about dichotomies. And your Twitter feed is filled with quotes of famous people, especially founders with contradictory points of view on, on the same topic. So I'd like to start by, by talking about why you think it's so important to be able to, to hold conflicting ideas in mind as an entrepreneur. Wow, interesting. Well, first of all, I don't have a, a big Twitter feed to, to speak. <laughs> right? it's like I'm, I'm like, I like retweet once every six weeks. That's a very deep, interesting topic, dichotomies. <laughs> so I think that people struggle to make opinions and, and I'm pretty good at discussing the other side of everything, right? Just, just to contradict, just to be a devil's advocate or just to show um, there's always conflict in everything that we're trying to do in life. And, and people don't want to acknowledge that, right? Don't, don't want to normalize that. Let's normalize dichotomies and conflicts. Yeah. So my, my point was basically why it's so important in your eyes that founders learn to hold these dichotomies. I, I think that the first thing is that whatever point of view you have, most people are just wrong, you know, in, in, in whatever they think. So I, I think the dichotomy is just really thinking of all the alternatives. Uh, second time co-founder, I, I invested in him before. He's, he died, failed, shut down, didn't want to sell it. When I told him to sell it, I had connected him with some people that were interested in acquiring him at the peak. Did not do that, just wandered down and now starting something else. And, and you assume that, and I'm telling him like, what you're thinking, it's like a million people are doing it or want to do it with AI, right? And it's like, this path that you're assuming of how things are going to work out, it almost never works out that way. And so if you think I'm going to bootstrap, then guess what? It's not going to work. The economy is like most people, will, many people will, will get, you know, venture capital. If you think you want venture capital, you should investigate what it's like bootstrapping and, and what kind of company. Like that's an example of a dichotomy, right? It's like, which one should you do? It doesn't matter. People waste time arguing about which one is better, but sometimes you don't even have an option. And so why why even discuss this, right? It's just wasting time 
discussing dichotomies. How have you learned sort out all the advice that you've heard in your journey as a founder? Because a lot of time that, that advice might be as well, like <laughs> counterintuitive or contradictory itself between the, your investors, the advisors, etc. That's a really good thing. People want me to advise them. And I struggle with that because I'm a person that I'm a, I'm a type A controlling, directing, I'm in charge and I know better, right? And so when people ask me for advice, I'm like, I will tell you, I will tell you to do this and you could be successful, could be, right? Potentially. But people don't listen to advice. People don't want to hear it, right? So that's the reverse of what you're asking me, right? So it's like, at first, I just noticed people don't want to hear. People just want me to tell them a nice story, tell them like, yeah, you're going to be successful. People just want encouragement. People just want... People just want to waste time and just talk to me and then not really take the advice. So like, why are you, you know? So I, now I want to put myself in the shoes and say like, I'm the opposite, I think. I actually tend to listen to advice and that's probably why I'm, I, I'm successful. It's because people say to me, you need to build a, some random VC told me like, I invested in such company and they have a great debt platform. I came back that day and I'm like, you know what, Drift needs to have a debt platform. And nobody believes, and I went and I built it, at, you know, people, nobody needed it. We were not as successful with it, I would say, but we did have thousands of apps built internally by companies that wanted to integrate. But most people would not follow up on that advice. I follow on advice. Somebody says, uh, you need to build a marketplace. You need to open a new office. I, I met with the CEO of um, Zoom. And the CEO of Zoom said, you need to have diversify your office because you cannot be 100% in Boston. This is before the pandemic. And like, I was talking to Eric Yuan, you know, at, at a table at a rooftop in uh, Sequoia event. And, and, and I just came back and I'm like, we're going to have to open a second office. And we opened Tampa, right? And I looked around. Uh, I went and asked other CEOs, when did you open a second office and blah, blah, blah. I listened to the advice and I follow through and I go explore it and I get it done. And then I learn whether the advice was good or not, right? I, I just have this optimistic view of, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, I'm gonna go do it. We need to build a brand. Okay, we'll go build a brand. We need to uh, hire great people. Uh, David sent me once to, um, he, this story was in podcast before, he sent me to a, a thing for Jocko Willing, some like seminar on leadership. And he drilled into me training, education of your team, right? Feedback, debriefing. I came back and that's when we first formalized that drift onboarding classes in a curriculum, in a training, so people could get off the, um, get off the start, you know, to, to a good start when they join the company. And so those are examples of things that I, on and on and on, people tell me things, I go do them. It seems like it has worked out for me. Going back to dichotomies, is there a particular one that you've struggled the most with as a founder? I think the biggest dichotomy is that I and every human being probably wants, naturally wants to do one thing. And so the, the joke is that with David, David would be like, build me a, a big platform or build me a successful app, you know, freemium. For example, in, in, when you're in, in engineering, you always say like, do you want it to be reliable or do you want it to be done quickly, right? And so, like, he would always be like, both, right? And he would just drive me insane because I just want to, I wanted to get a pass and say, oh, I just want to build a simple, nice, cute little app, right? Or, like, or I just want something that I don't have to support or I, I just, I just want in my life simpler and life was never simple. So I would ask him, do you want this or this? And he would be like, both. I'm like, Ugh. and then what I figure out is like, you have to do both. You know, you, you, if you just do one thing, you're not gonna be successful. You have to learn how to balance this other stuff that you think is impossible to do. There's always ways to rig the game. It feels like so, so much of the founder journey is being comfortable with those <laughs> conflicting ideas and operating in that middle ground for, for, for the most part. Yeah, you just gotta pick and just go for it, right? And speaking of, of the economies, one that I, that I, as I said you in the past week, one that I found interesting was that you've talked a lot about your life in the US, ca coming to the US, but relatively little about your life in, in Nicaragua. So I, I wonder which 
memories uh, from your time there stand out the most of you? Any particular lesson or, that you've carried over time? Think about it. I, I grew up in Nicaragua, zero technology in my household. I mean, I was born in 76, but in the 80s, you can hear people talking about computers and Silicon Valley. And my father, my mother got me an online account and I had an Apple I don't know, Commodore or like I saw the 1984 commercial for Mac and, you know, I bought these chips. Those are like people that were privileged, you know, and, and had this stuff. I didn't even have a phone in my house. I couldn't call people. I don't, I don't know what that's like, you know, and so like just get the environment right. It's a, my mother works all the time. My stepfather is not really helping in the picture. I go to school and there are very little bit of very no vacations, very little gifts. I learned to stop asking my mother when I was very little for things. It's so like, I would always be like, I learned finally to say, mom, if you have any extra money, could you buy me this toy, right? If you have any extra. So all those things, right, made me who I am, right? In that very little entitlement, okay, not having lots, anything I have, I appreciate it better. And, not get frazzled, you know, by uncertainty or, or lack of resources. Like I've always been scrappy, right? I've been able to do whatever I could with very little. So that creativity of how to attack problems or the gratefulness or the, or the toughness, right? The mental stamina to be like, if I don't have that, is that, am I going to survive? Yeah, I'm going to survive. Many great experiences as a child because I appreciated the small things, right? The little things. So that, that gives you a strength as an immigrant that, other entrepreneurs just simply don't have as much as they want to be entrepreneurs. Right? My dad always said per perspective is luxury. <laughs> yeah. It's, I guess it's well, those kind of things that you just can't go back. <laughs> Even if you have all the money in the world, <laughs> you can't travel back in time and try to live a life like that. Exactly. Something that I, that I find fascinating and I've heard you talk about is, is this dilemma, probably more than a dichotomy bit, uh, about risk taking that as an immigrant, well, uh, you will not know what to take extra risks because you already took a huge risk coming to 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 the US or to a new country. But your willingness to take risks is at the same time one of the or probably the, the most important predictor of your capacity to build wealth. And I've heard you talk about like burning the ships in the context of starting a, a company. Uh, but even to you, it took you took you like ten years to leave IBM. So I wonder if if you think there's a way to teach people to take risks at least earlier on in their careers? Yeah, I think that that's a good question, right? It's like, when did I learn to take risks? It's hard. I, I don't want to, in hindsight, say, like, I'm the biggest risk taker in the world, right, type of thing. I, I am a risk taker, but in some, in some cases, I didn't. And in some cases, I had no choice. And in some cases, I was oblivious of the risk that I was taking. You know what I mean? It, it, it's like... I think maybe all my risk taking comes from just the naivete on my part of just not fucking knowing, you know, it's like not knowing what was happening. I think that, that that's, that's the best part. I think if you, the more naive you are, the more you, risks you can take. You know, let's take three examples, right? I think one, coming to this country, I had no home. Like we were about to lose our home. In Nicaragua, anybody, or anybody around me didn't have jobs, didn't have like a stable job. People are always like hustling, like, oh, I'm gonna buy this car and, and I'm gonna sell it for more and then I'm gonna make that money. Like literally that could be that person's business, right? And it's like, I don't even, I, I don't even know like how people, the people in my neighborhood, which was the, maybe middle class, I don't, I don't know how they survived, right? I don't, I don't know what they did. Um, so coming here, I had no choice. I had a subsidized apartment and um, food stamps in this crappiest two bedroom, two bedroom little, some sort of weird unit in, in Tampa, Florida on Himes Street or Boulevard Road. I don't know what it was, but I mean, it, it was crappy, but I, I was happy. Like I, we had something, right? So, so that's the risk where I had no control over. I just had to do it. Like whatever it was, it was good. 
Um, the IBM one is the example of the risk that I couldn't overcome. It took 10 years for me to leave. I had many chances to leave. From the day I showed up at IBM, I tried to quit for the Y2K because of the, of the dot-com hype cycle. I was uh, being asked to go and start a company with some friends, and I, and I chickened out multiple times and tried to leave. And every time I tried to leave IBM, they would give me a raise, and I would be like so comfortable. And I was like, oh, they give me more stock. They did. Uh, and so, like, so that's an example where I did chicken out and I did not go and take the risk. And then there were other cases, like when I left HubSpot and could have made a hundred million dollars in stock and if I would have stayed and if I would have done everything right. So if I would have known what I was going to lose by doing that, maybe I would have not. Right. And so, but I had no clue whatsoever. And so I was just like, oh, fuck it. I want to start my own company. And I want to make my own billion dollar company from scratch without your help or anybody. And I want to go do it and prove that a Latino can do it. And I, and so, I got that. I did that. But I, I, I don't know. I might have made more than that HubSpot. And so it's, um, I, that was not, So it's naivete in all three of them, right? Speaking in the first example, you talked about having no choice. Like, is it possible to create those conditions, you think? And, I, and I'm asking you because I, in your own podcast, uh, The American Dream, I've heard you talk about how can you encourage more Latinos, immigrants to get into tech, start a company, invest into startups, which are usually seen as or is it risky, risky initiatives. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to understand, like, is there any way in which you feel people can create those uh, kind of boundaries or limitations so they're more prone to take risk and feel more comfortable with them? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is the whole goal, right? Is how do we teach? And, and I, I wish I had the sound bite, so we're going to have to work them out together here. But people should take more risk. It's like, that is the goal, especially immigrants, especially Latinos. Like if we don't take risks, we're never gonna make progress as, as, a, as a community, as a, as a group of people that are being exploited um, by not giving access to the opportunities. We have to break through our, the system ourselves. So I think that to do that, we have to take risks. So the, but then we have to break that down, I think, into what is risk, right? It's a that, that would be something important to, to ask someone when they're afraid of that, to understand what do they think the risk is, right? What's the worst case scenario? Like for example, when I try to ask people to join my company and they're like, they say it's risky, right? So for example, I was talking to someone and, and I said, join my company. And they're like, no, first I go, what, how is it going in your job? And this person says, this, we're in November right now. And the person says, I'm thinking of quitting my job in December, I, January, I'm going to go something new. Okay. So they already decided to quit without talking to me. And then they're like, okay, so join me. Well, oh, it's risky. Okay. What's risky about it? That it doesn't work out. Okay. So you know me, you know, so like, this is, this is like with my success, with my backing and everything, they're like, okay, I don't know yet. And then they're like, and then I'm like, What's the worst happening if, if it doesn't work out? Well, in six months, I find another job. Oh, okay. And you can get another job. Yes, I can get another job. So what's the risky part? So it's important that we learn to ask people, like, what is their notion of risk? People have, we make up a monster in our head that is risk. I think very few times where actually talking about a real risk you know what i mean that, that is like i don't know do you have an example of risk teach me maybe i'm being naive and oblivious maybe that's why i'm like an entrepreneur give me an example of risk T tell me a, a time in your life where you were like elias i had I, I made this risky choice and this is what i was risking i get your point a, a few months ago i was these are a couple of months ago i, I was presented this offer to start a, a fund. So in that case, I, I did took the, I stayed in my current job, so I did take the, the safe path. And yeah, and I mean, it's like, I literally thought about something similar to what you were saying, like it's risky, but then, but at the, it's interesting because at the same time I, I knew like it wasn't that risky at all. So I think it was- yeah, Hold on, so hold on, just set up the scenario, right? You, mm -hmm. what are you doing right now? You have your own startup? 
or you have your own no, business? No, I work at a, B, at a BC fund, yeah. Okay, so you, you work at a BC fund, you have a job, the stable choice, great. And you were offered to start a fund, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the risky thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the risk in your mind that you did not make the choice? What was the risk? It was twofold. I, I had just, I mean, I moved to the States a couple of years ago. So I felt in a sense like it was too early. The to, risk. to do what that the change. The risk was, I mean, it was a big combination between green card and visa and not being able, and losing that chance, which always would push me to, to go back to Latin America, at least for the, for the next years. You just found a good risk. That's a, that's a real risk. Yeah, yeah. So like yeah. if the choice that you're making, if in one way you have security that you will have the visa for immigrant as a real one, right? And what you were going to do was going to put your visa at risk and you had to go yep. back mm -hmm. that's a risky move right so i like that good losing your status and not being able to stay here because what immigrants want we want to stay here we want to have the papers we want to be legal so we can achieve our own american dream right but if you cannot do that that that, that you put everything at risk so i i that's a good one visa status is one of the top things is the number one thing when i'm advising immigrants right it's like you gotta get that you gotta get that one way or another Forget about the startup, because <laughs> those guys. Yeah. Have to okay, but so so that one will take out. You you beat me. You got you got it right. That's risky. Uh, the other one would be. I think what people most of the time worry about is money. I think is what I think most people. What I'm talking about is most people consider risk, a stable job, or the potential to make a lot of money doing something they don't like, or just being afraid of trying something new. And they most of the time risk is like fear of failure. Right. We need to have people get over that. Right? Speaking of failure, you, you, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the, I mean, the, the fact that you took the decision to leave HubSpot. And I, I think when I, when I study your career, it's very important to me that one of the most very important things that you have is the, the ability to spot talent or basically stay around talented people. I mean, then you ended up rejecting, I, I heard this story, you're rejecting the founders of HubSpot to go work with, with, with David. I think that was... That was before you guys were acquired by, by, by HubSpot. So, I mean, you could argue that meeting David was a, like a deciding to work with him was a, fu a fundamental probably move decision uh, in your career. I mean, I have no, no doubt you probably would have still been successful, but still that was a, that was a, that was a very important point in your, in your career. So like, what can people do to, let's say, find, meet, and stay together to the next Davids of their generation? You're, you're touching, you're pushing a button on mine right now that it, that it might be personal, right? It's like, I met David and without knowing how talented or successful David was at the time, again, being naive, I made a commitment to work with him. I was picking several people. I had some people, I had a, a friend of mine that, will, that, would, that did not go to become successful that wanted me to be a co-founder with him. To, um, to somebody else, to somebody else that did not become as successful either, but had a startup and it was, had success in on, on his belt. I mean, I had options around that time and I chose David with very little information, but I chose him and I stuck with it, right? I just made the decision. So step number one is make a choice because the opposite is not making a choice. It's like staying put, doing the same thing that you were doing before. No change in your life, no change in route, no change in decision. It's not going to equal success. So the first thing is make decisions, even if they're bad ones. That you know, go do something, right? If all the decisions you made, I know a lot of people that keep making the bad decisions every time. <laughs> and then like, and I was like, well, you know what? Just go get a normal job and just live a normal. Life. Don't 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 it's not going to work, right? Because what you need to find out is if you have the ability to make good decisions or you're lucky, right? But lucky doesn't happen every single time. And so I've been lucky too, right? It's not just my abilities or my decision-making or my gut or my experience or my upbringing or my diversity or my Latino-ness, right? It's like partly I'm in luck, right? Blessed, grateful, thank you. But so you got to make decisions you got to choose things. You can't just sit there and have the opportunities pass by. But I'll tell you this, you, you bring in the anger in me, which is like every time I've started a company, 
I meet people and I offer them to join the ship, to join the rocket ship, to join me. And every time I have more success and every time people say, no, I don't want to join. And I'm just blown away by how very few people really want to be successful or really want to win. That's my analysis. People claim people will watch the podcast says, I am interested. I want to be successful. And they don't realize that the opportunities are coming by them all the time. And they're constantly rejecting them is my theory. The, 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 the doors are opening and they don't even notice them or they flat out say, no, I don't like that door. No, it's too risky. No, when that comes in it. When David came to me and said, I met him that day at a luncheonette in Andover, Massachusetts. Says, Join me. That day I quit IBM. I did not know much. What did he say? What did he do? <laughs> he just says, join me. He says, Let's, we'll do this. I go, do you have money to pay me for like six months at least? Like, will you run out of money in six months? Yeah, we, uh, we have money. He just gave me a, a little bit of a confidence of like that he was... In some ways, David is full of shit too. Like, because we had the, the, market, the market crash, that company crashed in a year after that. We ran out of money, never grew past 10 people. So it, I could have I said, like, oh my God, like, you, you completely lied, right? This is what I mean. You got to just take a leap of faith and you got to try stuff, take chances. That's the risk. But the risk was. I don't know what the risk was. I had a job at IBM for 10 years, making $110,000 a year at the end at the peak when I left. And I got a job with him for $110,000 a year with a lot of uncertainty of a startup that shut down in a year and the market crashed. What is the risk? Was that risky? Let's look at that, right? Was that a risky move? Probably not as much. And I think if- No, no, but, but how, mo how would most people say 10 years at IBM, oh. IBM, was that a Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, most people would say you just left your whole career <laughs> to send it to the sidelines, yeah. Right, so, so, so you know what I mean? So I'm just giving you a, a concrete example. That's the, the decision I, that's the decision I made. And, mm -hmm. and I owe some money because they paid for me to go to Harvard. And I asked David, will you take care of that? And he says, yes. Maybe he wouldn't have taken care, right? You know what I mean? I don't know, but he did. Um, but I just took that risk, but in the end, It wasn't a risk. I don't know. It's just, we, I just want people to take risk and not think about them, right? Yep. yep. You, you mentioned you had all, other opportunities to join other startups or other people offering you to, to become a co-founder, but you still, I mean, you end up choosing David. So I wonder, like, I wanted like double clicking. What was special about David? Like, what, what particularly? He was, he was Latino. In him? He was Latino. I felt more comfortable. I felt more comfortable with him than I was with uh, maybe a white founder that I did not have the same level of trust. I don't know. It was a trust thing, right? Just, yeah, I think that, that that's why. And because I had the other ones and I just like, but the other ones were at different levels of success and, 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 and experience and different jobs and opportunities. But um, there was one that wanted me to do a copywriting, license, licensing, management of assets, startup, who I went later, I went and hired at Drift uh, years later. Full circle. Full circle. <laughs> uh, the other guy wanted to be a co-founder at Techstars. I went and then I hired at HubSpot, but two years later. Um, the other one uh, was in Rhode Island, started a company, and then the company got bought by private equity, did not go too far. Um, I think he's like a VC somewhere. He's well off. Uh, and, then, um, and then I had like, One of them was became Zoom Info. I said no, and I was going to be the VP of Engineer at Zoom Info. Uh, the other one was um, to be the VP CTO of something of a company uh, in the video space, video analytics space that got acquired for 10 million, did not do well. Uh, so yeah, it was several opportunities when I made the decision to, to start something with David. Awesome. So let's, let's change a bit gears, and I, I'd love to start talking a bit more about product and strategy and SaaS, uh, especially because today with the whole Gen AI I mean, explosion, like everyone is talking about how hard is it to create a like differentiation in a product uh, to create like unfair advantages. And, and I, but it's interesting because 
I, you guys saw this coming sort of in 2015 when you started Drift and the whole thesis right from the beginning was product differentiation is no longer the way to win in SaaS. What I would like to hear, like, is what were the early signs for, that led you to believe this thesis, that product feasibility was no longer, I mean, feasible in, in software as a service? The economy, right? Product differentiation is essential to success. Product differentiation is not essential to success, right? Um, there's a dichotomy right there, right? I would say that product differentiation, this is where people, this is the problem that people are like, oh, it has to be one or the other. This is a perfect example, right? It's like, it's both. The answer is both. I argue that if your product is not different, you're not going to succeed, period. It has to be different somehow. Why would anybody buy you? For it? You got to make it different. On the other hand, just product differentiation doesn't mean that you guarantee success, right? The problem is much bigger than product differentiation in 2015. We enter a market that was saturated with chats for support. And, and, and so what did we do? We differentiated by saying we're going to use the chat for sales and go figure that problem out. And so it's like you have to find a space where people are experiencing pain and have a real problem. That's the crux of the matter. The thing is that what people are doing that everybody's trying to play startups is that they just make shit up and they're like, oh, I got an idea. I'm going to make an API that is like a router. They just, you know, everybody's just trying to copy what something existed before there's any problem or pain and they're anticipating pain. And so they're like, make up a company and says, I'm going to make an LLM company and raise money. But they have no clue what they're going to do with this, right? So what the problem is that they need to do is they need to go talk to customers. What I what I do is I talk to customers and I'm like, what is the pain? What is the problem? How many people are experiencing? And find a niche. Start with something small. It doesn't have to be big. I talked to somebody that was interested in um, in state sales, right? And I'm like, well, go investigate that problem. Don't just pick the space. Um, that one was the opposite. It was excited about a space that doesn't know anything about it, right? So you you have to go and say like, how many people are there? What's the money? What's the profits? What's tech? What is the the hardest part of this of, of this of this job of this of this industry? Um, and so I think that you have to use all of the basics available, which is you need real problem, you need real pain, be different about it. You need to market differently. You need to have a different culture. You need to have a unique. You need to be yourself. You need to be authentic. You need to find out who you are. I promise, most people are just copying other people. I'm just going to be like that company. I'm going to be like that founder. Just be yourself, man. It's like, it's that, that's what it is. And and that's that's what I enjoy the most. Every time I try to be somebody else, I realize I just look like a fool. I just got to go back to who I am. Speaking of product differentiation and copying others, was this a re realization that you guys had when starting Drift or did you already had that idea in mind when operating and building the companies? You want a dichotomy? There's, a, there's another dichotomy, right? <laughs> I just told you, be yourself. But when we started Drift, we were like, what problem is out there? Let, let's, you can copy something to start with, right? So I'm a big believer in copying too, right? What a dichotomy. Be yourself and copy. How is that possible that those two things could live in the same space? Let's call this the podcast of dichotomies, right? Dichotomy. <laughs> I mean, the best artists copy. <laughs> the best artists copy. Yeah, that's, there's a phrase, yeah. <laughs> phrase, right? Like the biggest form of flattery is to copy. It's like, if, you know, if, if there's a great meal that is being made at a restaurant, copy the meal. <laughs> Why do you have to make it different if it's really good, right? Yeah. <laughs> you need to invent something different. Different is dumb. Copy what's good and enjoy it. Eat it, right? And so, like, so this is a perfect example. But then I say, be different. Guess what? Guess how these two things, I guess the secret of dichotomy is that both things can be true at the same time. You just have to find how they fit together. That's the perfect example, right? It's like, copy the product because you don't waste time copying. So you practice, so you do it, so you have something to show to people, whatever, copy the minimum, just so you learn what somebody else, you know, understand the problem and have something that is yours. But then you have to figure out how then, what do you make into it slightly different or apply it to a different group of people, find your own way to succeed because the, the world is too crowded with 
with entrepreneurs and ideas and businesses and, and existing companies and incumbents, right? So copy and be different. Be yourself and be like successful people, right? It's, it's like you got to do both. An, an area where you guys at Drift were very unique was your, your marketing uh, and brand. I read this quote by Andy Ruskin, who is this expert on, on strategic narrative saying, Drift thrives by acting less like a software company and more like a reality TV show. And I found that fascinating. So like, can you walk me through the, the initial thinking behind Drift as a brand? Where did, where did this idea to, to I mean, do marketing in such an unconventional way came from? I can say this because it's David, right? And then it's like, the truth is that um, I'm an engineer and, and David is a magician when it comes to marketing. But as an engineer, I approach everything like an engineer. What, I, what he did was simple, but not easy. It's like, the problem is that most people want to create marketing or do this and not put the effort in. <laughs> it's just like, it's just, they just think like marketing is like a one-time thing. But he, he put the effort. That's, that's the difference, right? He put the effort and he put the, the, like, they would do a podcast and they did hundreds of episodes of that podcast. Right. And um, until it clicked. Right. It's like people want to do a podcast for one series and then nobody listens to it. They marketed it. They put their they, they tweeted about it. They put it on LinkedIn and then they kept listening. They kept visiting people, contacting guests, doing all this work. Right. Like I'm, I have a podcast, but it's not like downloaded all the time, every time. But I'm sticking with it. Right. It's like as an exercise on persistence. Right. Uh, so I think. There's so many books written about how to create a brand, uh, how to create a category, how to market. Uh, we would read all the, you know, you know, behind the cloud and all this stuff, right? So it's like David is just an avid reader. He copied a lot and then made it his own. And then he put the effort in, right? But most people don't. They barely focus on the product. They focus on sales, right? But they don't focus on marketing. It's just where you focus. So he could focus on marketing and I could focus on building the product. And we both would copy and we both would differentiate and together it created a, a powerful combination. That's fascinating. And something that I find also interesting is that you guys came from HubSpot, which is probably one of the pioneers of the more traditional B2B content marketing, at least on the like the first internet age. Once again, I'm going to push or try to double click on where did that insight come from of making marketing so unconventional? Was it something you guys saw at HubSpot stopping that didn't work as well anymore? Just copy, right? I mean, you, HubSpot, you know, thrived under that, creating a brand, creating a category, inbound, be different, right? Do the opposite, you know, it's like, uh, it's, and so like, when you learn those things, I think most people don't know that, right? They, they're building companies and they don't know that. And if they do, they really don't know it because they're not doing it, right? It's like every new founder, you see that, well, I'm going to create a brand. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm going to create a new category. Well, okay, that's hard. You really want to do it? Yeah, I'm going to do it. But they don't do it. And so it's, it's you just got to do it. But yeah, we were fortunate. Like I said, it's always fortunate that I listen to the advice, right? When, you, when, when we saw HubSpot, we didn't leave and say, we're, we're going to do things differently. Right? No, I mean, a lot of the playbook looks the same, right? Created a category, conversational marketing. We wrote a book, they posted, they, there was an inbound marketing book, right? We had a conference, we had a conference. If it works, if it's good, don't fuck with it, just do it, right? But you know what? Putting a conference wasn't easy. Putting, taking the risk of putting a conference that a thousand people showed up on the very first conference that we had when we were very small, that required a lot of effort and invitation. I mean, I was literally at the front door of the building, like inviting everybody, texting everybody, come, 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 attend this, attend this, attend this, right? You have, you have to do this thing. So it's just people don't realize, right, that um, you, you have to do it. And you guys added your unique flavor to that mix, which is you, 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 made, it, you made it much more personal, which is, I feel like something that's very, that stands out about how Drift made marketing. I, I felt like HubSpot was very focused on the company and you guys at Drift were very focused on the people behind the company. Our conference, for example, was, you know, we had DJs, we had like one track, it was on a music stage, you know, we had graffiti, we had, you know, 
amazing food. No, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, just what we like, right? David and I like music. We like hip hop. We like reggaeton, graffiti. I, I did graffiti growing up. You know what I mean? So it's like I almost got arrested. You know, and it's like so you you draw upon who you are and you you try that out, right? And so it's just gotta be creative. You gotta take risk. In fact, full circle. Totally. Start to wrap up, and I'd love to get a bit of your thoughts on the the future of of SaaS. As we were talking to, there's a lot of like, a, I mean, copilot for X, Y, and C. A lot of AI tools coming coming to a market, which looks like like a red ocean. <laughs> I listened to this. I actually went to. I heard you live at the at the Saster conference. It was I think it was last year where you gave a a, a talk with David. And you and you had this idea that in in a saturated market you can't win based on features that you need a brand. So I I wonder how would you advise or how are you advising currently SaaS founders to think about a product today? Let's say if, you, if you're starting drift today in this Gen AI world, are there any things you would do differently? Of course, it's a completely different world. The world changed the day that ChatGPT was launched, right? And um, what would I do different? Yeah, I mean, now, I mean, it's so simple, right? It's like, well, now you got to decide the notion of a bootstrap or a profitable company is no longer looked down upon. And what a freedom if you can, if you can make a business that is profitable from day one. So you're unkillable, right? It's like, fantastic, right? Take that approach. The solution is not just throw money at things, right? You're going to be smart where, I mean, we raised a lot of money at Drift, but we wouldn't use it until we were comfortable using it. And then now look in retrospect, I could have used it better. Right. So, so we have that. So I would say how you get funded, you have no options. The money is just not flowing. So like now you got to learn how to do it in whichever way is possible. So, um, Gen AI for sake of Gen AI, Maybe if you're good at marketing or good at networking, you might get the money, but it doesn't mean you're going to get the success. So Gen AI alone is not the solution. Everything is commoditized. Everybody has access to the same Gen AI that you have. You don't have an edge. It still always goes back to like, you got to solve a real problem in an underserved industry, underserved community that has pain, that has money, or that at least, most importantly, has a purpose for you in your life. So if you find that, Hold on to that and go for it. Go hard. Just run right towards it. Um, that's really how companies are born. And I think that stop thinking about a big ten billion dollar idea. Think about something small, and then grow it by going into the adjacent markets or problems or industries or buyers. But start with something that you that, you, that somebody has a pain or a problem, right? And then it, it could grow. You just have to like be willing to listen to advice and be willing to say yes and try things. Do you think there will be more $10 billion companies, $100 billion companies? To me, it feels like what Gen AI allows is that the optimal size of, organiz of an organization can be much smaller, that you can do much more with much less resources, much less engineers and, uh, and employees. I mean, this, it's not like there's that many companies that are 10 billion. Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think that, um, I don't know. What I see in the world is that wealth concentrates. And and, and, and so I, I think it's going to keep concentrating one way or another, right? Just private equity will roll up a company or a company will acquire the rest or will outpace the other ones and suck the customer base because they do a better job. They differentiate it, right? So... I think that regardless of the Gen AI, the question is, is it going to always be incumbents or is it, we always worry, is there a way to break in again? I, I'm optimist. There's always a good way to break in. I think what people most of the time worry about is money, I think. is what I think most people, what I'm talking about is most people consider risk, a stable job or the potential to make a lot of money doing something they don't like or just being afraid of trying something new. And they most of the time risk is like, fear of failure, right? Uh, but yeah, I think they will continue to be. It, it's going to aggregate and consolidate. It's the nature of humans to be to be greedy and selfish and want more. What are the most common interesting discussions that you're having about ChatGPT, Gen AI, all this explosion of new technology with, with I guess, your, your peers at other software companies? I mean, you have other CTO, friends, VP of engineering. I wonder what are they saying about this? 
I think I, I think that's the problem. I think people are talking more than they are doing. Uh, I, I think that people are people don't understand that they need to drop everything that they're doing and go deep. That's my belief. They need to go deep down into this. Stop living your life like the way you're living it before November 2021, 2022, right? And just be like, go head first into this space, into this problem and how your company needs to be transformed. I think people are just giving it like 10% of their time or one team in there, or like I read tweets about it. I listen to a podcast that is not going to help you. And so I, I think the only way is to quit whatever company you're in and go start a company in Gen I. That That's the kind of risk I would take. Or like transform every project you can to use it, to learn it, to validate it instead of talking. Do you, do you think that this technology actually serves better uh, existing companies that have, I mean, pre-existing teams, data versus new companies? Like, let's say like, if someone was trying to build a drift of today from scratch, uh, do they have a, a, an edge with Drift itself? This this technology is unbelievable. It's it's good for everybody. I'm super bullish on it. I'd love to to start uh, wrapping up, and I'm asking you because you've been in I mean decades in the world of software, and and I think one of the prevailing ideas in the business world in venture in startups is that software businesses are the like the ultimate businesses, the best businesses because they have high margins that you can have high retention, I mean, keep clients for, for decades or years. Um, and in a way, they don't require a lot of capital to, to get going to start. Uh, if I force you to say to take the opposite side and ask you to say, what are the bad things about software businesses? What would be your, your debate points? That's a good point, economy. Uh, software businesses, there's very few profitable software businesses out there. <laughs> It's the greatest business there ever were, except the ones that where you just sell like an ebook. You know that that doesn't cost anything. Uh, those are the best businesses in the world. You sell an ebook and yeah, you just profit everything. Um, but software businesses are supposed to be the greatest, but yet they don't make profitable businesses. They're always burning money. They're so inefficient, even though they have these great software margins that we always speak of. So I think that that's the downside to it. I think that um, the other issue is that just to be devil's advocate, right? It's like software businesses are ex they're getting so boring and outdated and, and completely useless, right? It's like it's like the notion of having a web app to do something, it's getting so old, but those web apps don't really help my life. I, I, I look at every software service right now and I'm like, I hate them all. Like uh, the ones I like are like ability to email, my calendar works, I mean, look, there's an app here that I'm, we're recording this podcast. You know what? This is a good app. <laughs> this is a good app. I, we don't have to have a studio and we, we just meet online. This is a good app. You know, it's just not many great apps. ChatGPT is a good one. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like there's so much crap software out there, right? That doesn't really do a good job that it's not worth the value, right? So I think that that's the problem with software, right? It doesn't do a good job. It's poorly designed. It's not reliable. And it's really hard to do that, you know? Uh, and so it's it's like, the reason why those are attractive is because of the money in the VC community and the world and how LPs work. And I don't understand how much money is flowing around for this, but compared to other industries that are way more important, like automotive, <laughs> food, <laughs> groceries, those are the ones that are the most money in the world. We're just in a little tiny bubble called technology, right? But, um, a lot of value supposedly, but sometimes not, you know, but it's, it's um, the big ones like the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Googles, the Amazons. This have changed humanity forever, but um, Apple, right? But most of the other software, it's, it's hard to, to build something that you're really proud of, right? How is that informing what you're building right now? I would say that all of that is going into the input. Like I want to have a purpose. I want to build a better business. I want to build something that leverages AI, but AI is not the sole thing. I want to solve a pain that somebody has that might be big enough to be scalable and not just contract out my time, right? So everything I said here, it's is affecting my ideas, right? Of like, how do you pick a new company, right? How do you start something new? Elias, uh, have one last closing question. 
what's something beyond AI that's currently emerging that excites you? It could be a leader, entrepreneur, technology. Beyond AI? Something that, exactly. I mean, I think beyond AI, I think um, nonprofits, I keep getting more interested in that because I see people trying to make a big impact, right? Uh, in, in, in the world, in our community, and Latinos, I think nonprofits are something that we're overlooking in the industry, in, 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 in capitalism, and that we need to be, we're overlooking, right? And so we should do more. And then the other one is um, food, agriculture, climate, you know, there's just other stuff, biotech, right? There's other stuff that is, biotech is so primitive, it's unbelievable. Uh, so th there's a lot of other exciting stuff besides software and AI. But AI could affect all of them. It's a good thing. <laughs> this is a real deal. This is not crypto. Well, it's pretty clear what you're excited actually about. <laughs> I was not excited about crypto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yes, thank you so much for this time and really appreciate it. I le learned a lot about you. So thank you. Yes. Take care.